Thank you very much, uh, colleagues and our guests. Thank you very much for your patience. Our briefing is about to start. I will introduce myself. My name is Wayne Musabayana. I'm head of communication at the African Union Commission. And at this point, I'm just going to ask all of us to settle down so that we can begin our briefing. Okay, so this is the briefing, a very important briefing, because it precedes an equally important summit. And that summit is the Africa Climate Summit. It will be held in Nairobi, in Kenya, from the 4th to the 6th of September. And the theme for that uh, summit will be Driving Green Growth and Climate Finance Solutions for Africa and the World. Africa in solidarity for global climate action. And to give us our kickoff with the very brief remarks, we are joined from my extreme right by Honorable Sopian Soipan Tuya, who is the Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry of the Republic of Kenya. Then in the center, we have Her Excellency Ambassador Josefa Sako, and she is the Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment here at the African Union Commission. We then also are joined to my immediate right by His Excellency Ambassador Adekule J.M. King, and he is the ambassador of Sierra Leone and chairperson of the Permanent Representative Committee, not of the Permanent Representative Committee itself, but of the subcommittee on environmental issues. So these are our panelists today. They will kick us off with um, brief remarks, starting with the ambassador. Um, I beg your pardon, starting with the Excellency, the Commissioner, who is the host, and then coming to the um, Ambassador, and then finally from the Honourable Minister. So without much further ado, let me introduce Her Excellency, uh, Ambassador Josefa Sako, the Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy, and Sustainable Environment at the African Union Commission. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, my dear sister. Good afternoon, uh, good evening, every one of you, ambassadors, partners. Let me acknowledge the presence of uh, Our Excellency Honorable Sopian uh, Tuya, the Cabinet uh, Mini uh, Secretary of the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry of the Republic of Kenya. I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, His Excellency Honorable Minister, He's been made minister now. <laughs> so he's a minister, but he's a current ambassador, but he's going to leave us to be a minister of uh, uh, Southern uh, Western Integration. Region. Western Region Integration in uh, Sierra Leone. So His Excellency um, Ambassador Adekule King, which is Ambassador of Sierra Leone and the chairperson of the PRC Subcommittee on Environmental Issues. Excellencies Ambassador present here, partners, colleagues, it's really a pleasure for us to receive you here to give you a brief uh, about uh, this important event that is taking place in uh, Kenya from the 4th to the 6th of uh, September. This is the uh, inaugural African climate, uh, climate Summit. It's very important for us. So let me just uh, go, go, go to why are we trying to organize uh, this thing? Why we think that it is important for Africa to speak in one voice, for Africa to organize itself and be a partner, a global partner in this uh, conversation of the challenges that uh, we are going through the globally. We are going through globally. All of us, we are having issues of the climate change. So it's time for us to act now and to save this planet. So Africa is determined to bring uh, about transformative development in order to achieve the aspiration of our blueprint, which is the Agenda 2063, the Africa we all want. Linked to, to these lofty goals 
had the various flagship programs such as the African Continental Free Trade Area, the Industrialization Agenda, the Integrated uh, High Speed Train uh, Network, the Grand Inga Dam projects, the, and the CADEP. CADEP uh, uh, project for the transformation of agriculture on the continent. Those are the real uh, flagship program that we have. So, but this uh, flagship programs, we are not seeing much progress because of this issue of the climate change. We know that the environment is life, and where we live, we need to really take care of it. When, once it is sick, it is disturbed, we cannot achieve all the goals that we are setting to ourselves in, those, uh, in our blueprint uh, agenda, like the uh, Agenda 2063. Africa has the right, the right human and natural resources to achieve our development goal and to contribute to the development of all the continents as well as to addressing global challenges. Let me give you some, share with you some statistics about the impact of uh, this uh, climate change. Yet about we, in the continent, on the continent we have 400 million of our people in Africa have no access to clean, to clean drinking water because we don't manage the, our water per, uh, perfectly or good. And then we have 700 million have no access to good sanitation on the continent. As if that is not enough, because when we don't have water and sanitation, we have other issues about 44% uh, of the population is currently in darkness due to lack of electricity, whereas we have all the potential to really have this mostly the rural electrification, because we cannot talk about digitalization when we don't have light, so it doesn't happen. It, we have to look at it very seriously, because we need elect electrification. So with this, we, while we have also 800 million people in Africa have no access to clean cooking means, that is why deforestation is there, and our women, mostly in the rural settling, they are suffering because they don't have a very, uh, you know, uh, mechanical tools for them to remove all this dodgery that they used to use in their own set, uh, settlement, which implies that they are exposed to black uh, to black carbon, which is risky for their own life, even in, ter in terms of. Uh, public health, it's an issue. So I think those are the areas that we are going to debate and we are going to correct. Climate change has had a, a, a knockout effect on Africa's development and continue to subject, uh, subject more and more African into anger and malnutrition. If you read the latest uh, uh, report from FAO, you can see that this region is the region where we have more hunger and malnutrition when we have all the ecosystem, you know, favorable, conducive uh, environment to feed our own people and feed the world. So, so we have the issue of uh, stuntedness and poverty that is also accountable due to these uh, issues. Our economy are also shrinking due to the effect of climate change and the recovery from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic which has been very, very slow for us to, to recover. Debt stress has been compounded by the impact of, uh, of uh, COVID-19, climate change, and the unfair international monetary system, which tend to be biased against Africa. Our access to those funds, even the climate fund, is really an issue. That is why the team of this uh, edition, the first edition, is really rightly, ri rightly said we, we want to drive a green, uh, we want to drive a green growth and a, clear, a climate finance solution for Africa in, and the world. So th I think that's an area that we really need to focus uh, very strongly. Therefore, with the wisdom of our head of state and government, they decided for the African Union to convene an African climate summit, and we are gratefully to the government of the Republic of Kenya through His uh, Excellency President uh, Williams Ruto for graciously off offering to host it in, in Nairobi from 4th to 6th September 2019. 
2024. And we would also like to welcome Minister here to come and brief us and the, with uh, my, our partners, the ambassadors accredited here, so that you know that uh, we, you can come and join us because this is our conversation, but we want you people to come and support us where you have changed experience, knowledge changing. The summit will be uh, attended by, the, uh, by African leaders alongside all the global leaders. We invited also all the global leaders and other relevant stakeholders to address climate change challenges and advance sustainable solution in Africa. The summit will provide a platform to address the intersection of climate change, Africa's development, and the need for increased global investment in climate action, particularly in Africa. We are not um, uh, polluters, but uh, we are the most vulnerable on that. Our emissions responsibility is less than 4%. So that is why we are saying that this continent should be really assisted on those impact of climate change. To seek, to, to seek the launch of a renewed African ambition for green growth and promote climate finance solution, the expected outputs include the African leaders, uh, the African leaders Nairobi Declaration on green growth and climate finance solution, a pathway to a new global financial deal, investment commitment, and announcement of major initiative. African Union member states and partners are invited to champion the green growth agenda and the, uh, the green growth agenda and the climate finance uh, plan. Pre presents this, uh, this, these two uh, areas, they present or tools, they present a transformative partnership opportunity and track new finance and investment. The summit's output will serve both Africa and the world's ambition for climate action, focusing on five core uh, uh, growth uh, drivers, including, I will just go through because of the interest, on the interest of time. So we will go, we are going to look at the just energy transition, renewable energy. This is key in compass, expand, uh, uh, exp expanding electricity access, uh, ensuring clean cooking uh, avail availability, enhancing energy efficiency, and explore, exploring renewable energy exploring renewable energy possibility. The second one is green mineral and manufacture. The third one is a, a sustainable agriculture, land and water, Economy ocean uses. The fourth one is a, a sustainable infrastructure and urbanization. And the fifth one is the nat uh, natural uh, uh, capital. Also, we'll be discussing other issues of adaptation, resilience to climate risk, and carbon fin uh, finance. Therefore, this inaugural Africa Climate uh, Summit provides an opportunity for Africa to consolidate its united voice on matter of climate change, sustain sustainable development, and to mobilize support for the implementation of the continental programs and policies such as the African Union Climate Change and Resilient Development Strategy and uh, the Action Plan, which covers almost all these thematics that we are doing. So we really need to implement this, our own African Union Climate Change. This is our common position all these issues that we are talking is already Im embedded in this uh, uh, strategy. It will also have uh, pre-events such as the Climate Change and Development for Africa Conference and the Youth Conference, with which will also feed into the summit. On behalf of the chairperson of the African Union Commission, His Excellency Musa Faki Mohamed, I would like to appeal to all heads of state and government, ministers of foreign affairs, finance, uh, environment, and agriculture to attend this very important summit in order to unlock Africa's development potential. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to Commissioner Her Excellency Ambassador Josepha Sacco for that introduction. And now we move on to bring in Ambassador, Minister, congratulations, Minister. Uh, but he is here today still in his capacity as the Ambassador of the Republic of Sierra Leone. 
um, and also as chairperson of the subcommittee on environmental issues of the permanent representatives uh, committee of the African Union. Um, Excellency, it's over to you. Thank you. Greetings, honorable ministers, excellencies, development partners, fellow Africans. I am honored to address you today as the chair of the Permanent Representatives Committee, Subcommittee on Environmental Issues of the African Union. Africa stands at a critical juncture in history. The challenges posed by climate change require our united action and unwavering commitment. As representatives of our great nations, we hold the collective responsibility to safeguard the future of our people and our planet. The PRC Subcommittee on Environmental Issues is dedicated to ensuring that the aspirations of our member states are translated into impactful actions. We, the representatives of our beloved continent, gather to deliberate, strategize, and chart a sustainable cause forward. It is heartening to witness the rising tide of youth-led climate initiatives across our diverse landscapes. Our young leaders are pioneering renewable energy projects, advocating for climate policies, and nurturing sustainable practices. Their passion and commitment inspire us all. As the convener of the Africa Climate Summit, the African Union provides a platform for dialogue, collaboration, and transformative action. This summit is a testament to our continent's resolve to take charge of our destiny and drive a climate resilient development that resonates globally. We stand committed to amplifying your voices, your concerns, and your solutions. Through constructive dialogue and strategic partnerships, we are advancing policies that promote climate resilience, sustainable development, and environmental justice. Our shared vision is one of climate resilient communities, thriving ecosystems, and a future where every African can pursue their dreams without the shadow of climate uncertainty. In the spirit of unity and collaboration, let us seize the historic moment, this Africa Climate Summit, to redefine the narrative of our continent. Let us empower our youth and women, honor our traditions and shape a future where Africa's interests are not only protected, but also serve as a beacon of inspiration for the world. I invite you all to engage, to contribute, and to drive change. Together, as proud representatives of Africa, let us leave a legacy of hope resilience and transformation through the upcoming Africa Climate Summit. Thank you. Asante, Metsi, Sukra, Muto, Obrigado. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister. Uh, we now move on to Honorable Minister Soipan Tuya, who is the Cabinet Secretary in the Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry in the Republic of Kenya. Honorable Minister, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible enough? Um, Excellency Ambassador Joseph Asako, Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development and Blue Economy, and sustainable environment. Um, Excellency Ambassador King, Ambassador of Sierra Leone, and Chairperson of the PRC Subcommittee on Environmental Issues of the African Union. Excellency Ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good 
evening is it good afternoon uh, I want to say that uh, we have come full circle uh, it was right here in the precincts of the African Union headquarters in February this year that Her Excellency Commissioner Josefa Sako and I initiated uh, the process through sittings of putting together the Africa Climate Summit. Following the offer by His Excellency, the President of Kenya, Dr. William Ruto, uh, of Kenya's readiness to host such a summit as the current coordinator of the African Union's Committee of Heads of State and Government on Climate Change. The 36th Ordinary Session of the African Union Assembly granted Kenya's request and approved that Kenya and the African Union Commission do co-host the Africa Climate Summit from the 4th to 6th of September 2023. We are back here and gladly so to announce that the plans for the summit have been finalized and that Kenya and the African Union Commission are waiting for the world in Nairobi in under three weeks from now. We have recorded overwhelming interest in the summit and have so far registered and accredited over 13,000 delegates from 136 countries. We have the confirmations of 15 uh, heads of state and government from Africa and the confirmations are still streaming in, as well as uh, quite a number from uh, global leaders and uh, partners across the world. Uh, and this includes high level representatives from the international organizations, civil society, business and private sector, and the youth. We are here in Addis to meet with the Permanent Representatives Committee of the African Union, as well as the Ministers of Environment under the umbrella of uh, AMSEN from across Africa to uh, push this agenda and request them to interest their presidents, heads of government, and their senior government officials to attend and participate in the Africa Climate Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, the past few months, in the past few months, we have been engaging intensely with African leaders and different groups on what the summit should achieve. We therefore look forward to having as a key outcome of the summit, the Nairobi African Leaders Declaration on Climate Change and a solid call to action, which will among others include the call for a new climate uh, change financial architecture, as well as a, prof a process of recasting Africa's debt situation, given the climate change and debt nexus, and the fact that for most African countries, they are not able to engage in proper adaptation and mitigation activities due to debt distress that leaves very little or no capital to engage in climate change related action. The inaugural Africa Climate Summit is unique in many respects. It is, as has been said, the first of a kind. It is the first time that the African Union has called all African leaders for a conversation fully, fully dedicated to the topic of climate change. The summit has been long in the making some of you may recall that in 2019, the African Union Assembly passed a resolution that called for this summit. The African leaders were prompted by the fact that the African continent and Africans themselves bear the greatest burden of climate change, despite the fact that Africa's historical and current emission levels of greenhouse gases is very low. The African leaders were also concerned by the fact that at other international fora on climate change, uh, the developed countries make promises year in, year out, but the promises and pledges are not met with any solid commitments or actions 
to see through the globally agreed measures that would help climate change adaptation and mitigation. The summit is therefore one that is uh, proposing um, a, a very bold and new narrative so that we don't continue doing things the same way and expecting different results. The international meetings on climate change have done very little to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, which are rising by the day. New reports by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change show that carbon emissions are increasing and the world is not on track to keep temperatures within the 1.5 degrees as set a target under the Paris Agreement. Against this background, the Africa Climate Summit has therefore been planned to show the solutions that the continent of Africa can provide to the global community in combating climate change. The solutions that will be fronted from the Africa Climate Summit are therefore those that are calling for the urgency and the scale and also that we have to approach this from a global perspective. The summit is going to show the immense resource potential in Africa, and I will not go into the details as High Excellency has put out the statistics in terms of the potential, the untapped potential that lies in Africa, the renewable energy potential ranging from solar, hydro, and wind energy, uh, the continent also boasts of large arable agricultural land that, if properly exploited, can feed the whole world with least emissions of greenhouse gases. Africa, in this summit, will also showcase its critical green mineral potential and advocate for value addition of these minerals in Africa to create jobs for the large and growing population and reduce the carbon footprints of processing these minerals outside of the continent. Africa will be showcasing it, the immense carbon sink potential that go a long way in ensuring uh, the much needed carbon sequestration. Africa will be urging the world to bring capital that is adequate, equitable, timely, and at scale to match these resources as we move the world towards a green growth and low carbon development pathway. Ladies and gentlemen, the Africa Climate Summit is not going to be a forum for blame games. It is going to provide an opportunity for partnerships where Africa and the world are offered trade and investment opportunities in ways that ensure sustainable development. Africa is willing and is demonstrated through this summit to commit its assets, including uh, those that have been espoused, um, to lead the global decarbonization agenda. That is what the summit will be about. It is time, Africa, it is time uh, that Africa uh, became the solution provider to global problems, as opposed to the normal uh, stories and depiction of Africa as a vulnerable continent awaiting support from outside uh, because we believe that with the immense uh, resources that we have that require the capital, require the um, innovations that we may not have, uh, will actually be available for investments that provide a global decarbonization for everybody. As Africa, we are committed to pursuing a vision of climate positive green growth that will drive inclusive economic growth, poverty reduction, and job creation while limiting our emissions and contributing significantly to global reductions. Ladies and gentlemen, the African Union and Kenya are inviting you to come, engage, and participate in this uh, summit in September. And thereafter, we will continue this um, advancing the outcomes of the summit in other global platforms, including the UN General Assembly, the COP28, and other uh, international forums. We are waiting to host you in Nairobi. Karibuni. Thank you very much, Honorable Swaipan Tuya from the Republic of Kenya. 
So, colleagues, we have now come to the section where we do our question and answer. Um, and you will pose your questions to specific uh, panelists up here. So, once we get started, you will raise your hand if you have a question. And if you've been asked to speak, please start by giving us your name and the news agency that you're representing. And as I speak about that, I think it's an opportune moment for me to also welcome all the colleagues who are joining us online. Uh, looking through the numbers here, we have 125 people who are joining us online. So thank you very much uh, for this interest in this uh, very important summit. Those of you who want to send in your questions online, from online, and this is only for journalists, by the way. Only those who are journalists can send in their questions, and you can use this number, plus 254-725-516089. So you can send in your questions through that WhatsApp number, identifying yourself by name and by the organization that you are working for, and I will then pose your question to the panelists here. I think also to make my work a little bit easier, uh, also indicate to whom that question is intended. All right, so now let me start with those who are here to see if we have any questions coming from the floor. Please, sir, go ahead. Uh, my name is the has been clearly mentioned that pledges and uh, promises has been met since the Paris Agreement and has not yet been met with a solid commitment and actions. And what are the plans of the African Union and its plans in the uh, upcoming uh, COP in regard to, with regard to this? It's been a, a long time just rolling over promises and uh, other again and again. And uh, the other question, what I would like to ask to the Commissioner is, uh, what are the initiatives in, with regard to the uh, carbon market in utilizing and uh, unleashing the potential that Africa has, uh, and even enhancing and capacitating the nations uh, with this regard? Uh, especially, I think uh, it's quite visible that the African Development Bank is doing some uh, flagship projects with regard to solar and other Africa and so on. And what are the practical things that are ahead that you are planning to Over to you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. Uh, your first question on, in, on the pledge and is to say that uh, we, should, uh, we should really rely on our own domestic uh, resources first because we've been having getting pledges, but you know. The, uh, the the Western countries are not really complying with uh, what they promise. So I think uh, it's time for us to really start, you know, having our own uh, resource uh, mobilization. That's why this uh, particular uh, uh, summit is very important because one of the area where we really have a bottleneck is about finance and investment in the uh, uh, climate action. And, that, and we believe that with this new initiative, this solution, climate finance solution that we are going to debate and to put it as part of our, uh, uh, our priority, we will solve a lot of problems, even internally. Let us look what type of resources we have at, at local level. We have a lot of initiatives. Many countries are doing a lot. Our com uh, African countries are spending 2% of their budget to climate actions. Uh, I will say uh, the examples are there. Let me talk about my own country from Angola. We, use, we have uh, the, the drought, very serious drought in the southern region in uh, Namibia. My government was able to build a dam with our own resources. We did not play any, we didn't wait because all the, f the population, the community there, they are uh, pastoralists and they lost all their animals. So the government came with its own effort, you know, to mitigate the impact of climate change. Here in Ethiopia, 
we know that we have also the problem of uh, drought in in the uh, uh, in the Horn of Africa. Ethiopia today, because of the impact of U U uh, Ukraine, those are conflict Ukraine and the uh, and the uh, and the Russia crisis. U U uh, Ethiopia today is producing wheat and is importing at the regional level. So I think our, our, our countries are really making a lot of effort. We have a lot of initiatives here. We have, like I said on my statement, we have uh, our own um, African, um, African climate change and uh, resilient development strategy. If we go through implementation phase, I think we will alleviate all this and we will start having a resilient transformative you know, action for most of our sectors, mostly agriculture. Uh, we have agriculture, industry, and uh, energy. We really need resilience program because to, in order to combat and get ourselves, you know, uh, uh, resilient to all these uh, shocks that are coming. The second question you said about the carbon market. Indeed, we are in conversation with partners and to say how we can talk more about uh, carbon market because many of our, our, our community or our leaders even, they don't know the mechanism of this car carbon market. And we know that we have a lot of potential. So we need to first of all, to, not, you know, to, to try to make advocacy and present what type of, uh, this, uh, what does this carb uh, carbon market means. Because once we, when, when we go in our conversation on some platform, we see the way African carbon, you know, people that are working, countries that are already working on carbon market, the, uh, a ton of uh, carbon in Africa is $8. But a ton of ma a market uh, in the other regions with the same problem, you know, it's about $60. So those are the type of areas that we, we are trying to really, you know, create awareness of the importance of this one and try to, you know, come out with the proper initiative amongst us through workshops, through a lot of... Uh, a change, a knowledge, a change, and we know that one of the countries that is doing very well is the Gabon. Gabon is doing very well. Last year we were there for the climate week, uh, and uh, we saw some good lessons, good examples of uh, Gabon in terms of uh, get, get gaining something, but the price is still very low on the carbon market. So we are working with UNECA and uh, see how we can uh, start working with our member states so that we can also put it uh, you know, on the win-win pathway uh, for the continent. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. We will now take a question from one of our colleagues who is online. But before I take that question, I need to see how many possible questions we will have from the room so that we can better manage time. Do we have uh, many questions that are going to come up? We have one hand. All right, so I think I can take these two questions from Judith Akolo, who is working with the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation and she's in Nairobi. Judith says, how does Africa intend to go green when most countries are still dependent on energy generated from fossil fuels? The second question, what are some of the ways that Africa intends to use to generate internal resources to drive its green growth agenda other than dependence on external funding from the developed north? So I think perhaps I will allocate the first question to the minister and then um, the second one to the commissioner with a comment from um, the honorable minister. Um, thank you very much. Uh, this is to Judy. How we intend to go green uh, when uh, most African, is it African countries, mm -hmm. are uh, fossil, fu yes, fossil uh, fuel dependent? Yes. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we all agree on is that uh, the decarbonization agenda is very important. It's very critical. And uh, there is no better time than this for us to recast our uh, strategies on decarbonization. And uh, the, the framing of the summit is such that uh, uh, the, the key pillars of the summit actually uh, do a very good job of summarizing the, um, the, the renewable energy potential for Africa um, and, and uh, the 
the arability of uh, land in Africa, uh, the carbon sinks, and the need for us to come together in one uh, common voice is that we need to strike the balance. For those that are uh, fossil fuel dependent, we have opportunities for decarbonization through an investment, green growth investment pathway. And those are the conversations we are inviting. And it is a win-win. And uh, through the summit uh, uh, discourse, we are also saying that uh, one of the greatest impediments to most of our African countries, even to do the just transition, is the debt distress uh, situation, which is going to be the core discussion within uh, the summit, uh, so that we do not continue with the current situation where uh, development and climate action are mutually exclusive. It is not sustainable. We cannot, they, they have to go hand in hand. And that is why, as we talk about green growth, we are talking about the financing aspects. And uh, we are going and working around the clock to make sure that uh, we have a common position that cr brings a win-win for everybody. Because even for countries that depend on fossil fuels, we are in agreement that we need to move, we need to transition. So it is about how, how do we do that in a just fashion? How do we ensure that um, there is equity, fairness in the proposals that are put on the table in terms of investments and uh, financing opportunities? So uh, that there in, uh, in the question raised by Judy is the reason why we are putting our heads together so that uh, we can come up with win-win solutions that uh, deal with our debt issue, uh, the development agenda, to go hand in hand with the climate action and decarbonization. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Over to you, Commissioner, for the second question. And then after you have done, I would uh, also uh, wish to have the view of uh, the Ambassador on that very same question. And that question was, what are some of the ways that Africa intends to use to generate internal resources to drive its green growth agenda, other than depending on external funding from the developed North? Thank you. Uh, to me, is uh, first of all, at the national level, our government have to know that uh, 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 the issue of environment and climate change is not just a, a, a rhetoric. It is a fact because we are living on it. We are seeing it every day. We are seeing the way you know the, this uh, climate change uh, actions is really devastating Africa. So, if we want to survive, to, to rescue our community, our our populations, as a government, as a policy, we need to really have. Uh, uh, and I mean, uh, uh, at least we need to really put some uh, percentage on the climate action in the budget, in the national budget. We, we have done it in agriculture with the Malabo Ma Maputo Declaration. The head of state came, they said, food security is a priority for Africa. We should invest at least 10% to the budget. If we do it for the climate action, I think we will solve most of the problem of uh, uh, local, I mean, uh, domestic uh, mobilization. So it has to start from the government because today we see that all these uh, these uh, these uh, sectors or these issues that we are looking at the global agenda, like climate change, crisis, all these, they are all interlinked. So we can we can know, and the impacts are there. The impacts are there. So in order to pre prevent any. Uh, Escalating, you know, uh, 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 risk on th on those uh, on those uh, issues. It's better for us to really, when we are setting our. That's why I'm happy that during this uh, uh, this summit we have ministers of finance. Let him let them sit in table with us, and when we are dividing the cake, this climate action. Because most of our countries we have ministries of environment, and those ministries have to really be on board the way the ministries of uh, health, the ministries of education, the ministries of agriculture have to be, you know, and the ministry of infrastructure. All these are really issues of development. 
It's, we cannot put it aside. That's the way I see it. And we can also, through this uh, carbon market, mobilize the private sector, the African private sector, to be interested on that, so that we can also you know, have some uh, type of uh, uh, investment in those areas. To me, that, that is uh, really the reason. And like I said in my first uh, answer, we, we, we should not rely on external funds. We have to, Africa has a lot of natural resources. If it is properly governed, if it is properly managed, I think we can really take, it's a matter of uh, policies and it's a matter of priority. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Um, Ambassador King, I don't know if you have an additional comment. Yes, yes, please just repeat the question. So again. The question was, um, let me just find it. All right. So um, Judith is asking, what are some of the ways that Africa intends to use to generate internal resources to drive its green growth agenda uh, without depending on external funding from the developed north? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, we must learn to throw down our buckets where we are knowing fully well that we are surrounded by waters. Interpreted to mean, help yourself, and perhaps others will help you. We don't have to sit and cry and wait for external support. And there are many ways, um, as African nations, we can achieve this. For example, um, we can impose environmental tax on some of the um, multinational companies mm -hmm. that are doing um, mining operations and activities in our different um, countries. And also, we should increase knowledge of our um, public sector workers and knowledge of what we have in situ before we offer um, some of these um, contracts to these multinational companies because when they come to negotiate you realize that there is what is known as knowledge asymmetry they know more about what is um, in the ground than you the government and so we mortgage our resources so one way we could address that is by also having clauses in the agreements that provides for corporate social responsibility obligation of some of these companies as Minister of Labor in Sierra Leone, I visited a mining site in 2019. It was sickening to see, um, you know, what has been left behind as a result of the exploration and exploitation of root oil in that community. We entered that community um, during the night. It was as if we entered the, the belly of hell, the bottom of the sea. Complete darkness whilst electric cables, you know, run overhead into the mining complex or facility. I said to myself, no, this is unacceptable. It's exploitative. It's wicked. Because the people in this community, you know, cannot benefit from basic electricity. So one way, one way we could address this is by you know, imposing the need for um, corporate social obligation, corporate social responsibility obligation. And also, um, we should also implement policies that deal with intergenerational and sustainable development. Take, for example, we talk about the oil in Nigeria today. The oil in Nigeria. These resources are non-renewable resources. Once they are exhausted, you cannot replace them. So this generation today, enjoying the wealth of the oil deposits, when they exploit it, they exhaust it, 50 years after. So what are you going to do for the future generation? They have no resources to use to finance development. So we should put in place intergenerational equity trust funds, things like this. We should put in place sustainable development practices, wherein 
These resources, for example, cannot be used sustainably, but we should look at issues such as quasi-sustainability. By that I mean, by quasi-sustainability, I mean we can provide scholarships for children. Can you imagine a poor, ch a poor child from one back village in somewhere in any part of Africa, you provide um, opportunity for that child to attend the best university in Spain, the best university in Russia. If you have a Russian company, they are the best university in America. So we invest in them, quasi sustainability. And then um, also, I think, um, yes, I've mentioned the environmental tax, investment in education, resto and then again. We should also put in place policies that deal with the restoration and decommissioning of our environments. Take, for example, the Norwegians, for example, in the North Sea. After, um, you know, say, exploration of a mining fuel, they look at possibilities of transforming that particular location into a fishing reef, wherein fish will come and feed. But um, in most places in Africa, <laughs> Sierra Leone, for example, I visited that mining site operated by an Australian company. They just exploit the resources, abandon the place, leave it very dangerous for even children to play around, wherein they will drown themselves there, they kill themselves. So we should actually acquire knowledge, we should raise resources from within, and then we should embark on sustainable and intergenerational policies. I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador. Now, um, I saw some hands from our partners earlier on, but allow me please to finish with uh, the media and then uh, we will accommodate um, others if, if, if we have um, enough time. And there has been a flurry of questions coming from online journalists. So the first one is from Andualem Sisai from online media new business ethiopia and andualem says my question is why is it significant to host this conference in terms of pushing africa's sustainable development agenda i think since i there you wanted to say africa's agenda 2063 uh, with uh, climate friendly energy sources commissioner this one is for you can you come again why is it significant to host this conference in terms of pushing Africa's Agenda 2063 with climate-friendly energy sources? Thank you. I know that our Agenda 2063 has, uh, has put uh, climate, uh, climate action and environment issues very, 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 very clear. So it's clear that is why we have this department of uh, uh, agriculture, sustainable, I mean, rural development, uh, blue economy, and a sustainable environment. So we are really committed in this agenda. And uh, we've been saying that uh, we are going from one cop to another, one cop to another, and we don't see anything. That's why our head of state and government, they took a decision for us to have for the first time, let us sit. We are, we are well organized in terms of the climate agenda. We have cowards, we have the organ, the proper organ in African Union that deals with this agenda of climate. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, cowards, we have our STC, we have a STC that is also looks at uh, the, the specialized technical committee, which is ministerial, it also looks at the issues of uh, environment and water, all this. So what I, what I want to say is that we, throughout we are in COP27, we don't want to go to COP1000. Like I'm saying, in not all the platform, we all we all will be dead. Most of us that are assisting this conversation, so we we want to stop COP one one thousand. COP one COP today is becoming a tourism. It's becoming a tourism instead of it to solve the real problem. We go there, we pay bedrooms in those capitals for two thousand dollars. You know, when you when you stay there for ten days, you are paying two thousand dollars. In ten days, that is twenty thousand dollars. You can transform a life in a small community in the rural settlement. You can bring light to those people. You can bring new type of uh, cooking uh, tools to those people. So we cannot just go there and. Uh, stay there for almost one month, eh? and there is no deliverable. 
There's nothing that comes out. We are lucky that uh, the last uh, uh, COP 20, uh, 2027 in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, we could at least you know, table uh, the, the issue of uh, adaptation was in the conversation and lost and damage. Uh, but we have to be, go more. So the advantage of this, uh, this, uh, this uh, event, I mean this summit, is that what we are going to say here is what we are going to take there. And we want to do it together because our, our, our own uh, this thing, our own uh, policy here is to talk in one voice. And the problems are similar from the northern part of Africa to the southern part of Africa. So we want this, the success, this declaration, this uh, uh, Nairobi declaration to be our, our own, our own uh, bill to, 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 to introduce so that they should adopt. Because this is our problem. This is made in Africa. This is a demand driven through African Union, through our member states. It is not coming from the other side. So I think we need to value our own responsibilities. So when we go to our partner, we say, this is what we want. Because when you look at the EU, they have every, every year they have an initiative. They never carried us along. They never engage with us. They do it among their community. And that after when we are discussing during our part for, uh, partnership, uh, EU, AU, they say, this is what we want. That's the way we should go. We should change the ambassador uh, minister say we should change our narrative and go the way forward because it's no longer that era where we didn't have skill. Today we have skill. We should not allow people to come and hijack our ideas. At times they don't have ideas. When you say I want to do this, look at the Great Green Wall. It has escaped in our hand because of poverty, because we are not taking our own res responsibility. If we take our own responsibility, we initiate our own initiative, the, 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 the partners, they will come. But they will come with 20% or they will come in technical uh, support, but not, they cannot do it all. They too, they have problems in their own country. They will not take care of us. So that is uh, the question. Thank you very much. Um, do I see any hands from the floor? Um, priorities for the journalists first. Thank you. Let me go back to the journalists who are online. And uh, this one is Chloe Farrand, who is writing for African Arguments. And um, Chloe says her questions are for Honorable Soipan Tuya, the first of which I can answer because she's asking about the number of heads of state and government who have confirmed attendance. And you have already in indicated that it's 15. Then she goes on to say, could you please respond to accusations put forward in an open letter by nearly 360 civil society groups that the African Climate uh, Summit's agenda has been unduly influenced by consultancy McKinsey, which is pushing a, their own agenda. Minister, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, we, have, uh, we are aware of uh, the online uh, uh, accusation that uh, uh, certain uh, international think tanks have hijacked the agenda, and that is uh, extremely far from the truth. Um, as we have said, this is an African climate summit, but we are also inviting the world, you know, global partners, uh, global leaders um, who are interested to hear the African narrative and the proposals we are putting on the table, uh, which are saying that uh, all the initiatives that have been done, the COPs, uh, the call for reform of international financial institutions, the Bridgetown uh, initiatives, all these initiatives are good and uh, they, they are all attempting to respond to the climate action and the climate crisis uh, that we have in our hands. But we are saying that uh, those are not enough. From the African perspective, they are not enough, and we want to present our lens of what we want to see in terms of uh, climate action. So by the global nature, of the summit and the discussions that are going to be uh, carried on at the summit, we have different partners, and I have just stated we have civil society organizations, 
we have consultancy firms that uh, have come and listened to what we are saying and they have input and they have suggestions. Um, but uh, I can confirm to the world that uh, this is the African position that we are projecting. Uh, we have a, a draft declaration <coughs> that has been circulated to all heads of state to input and, uh, you know, we, we are going to have it uh, read out jointly by the African heads of state in Nairobi. And uh, that is the African agenda. That it has had contribution from uh, global players, yes. And it is because of the global nature of the proposals we are putting on the table. But we are presenting an African agenda in Nairobi. Thank you. Thank you. I'll come back and, to you, and Minister. Sorry, just to say that, uh, and we have invited uh, civil society organizations, are very critical players. Uh, and uh, in fact, we have had a number of pre-summit engagements with the varied uh, civil society players. And we are going to have another very uh, robust uh, pre-summit uh, activity in the run-up to the summit, uh, led and spearheaded by civil society organizations. And uh, we have a fully-fledged secretariat in Nairobi engaging with everybody, the youth, the women. I can see uh, some youth leaders here. Um, and engaging with different civil society organizations. And I want to say that we are open for anyone to come forward and uh, engage, put, put your issues on the table. And we are not closing out anybody. And least of all, civil society organizations, because we value their input. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll come back to you again because this is um, related. So this question is coming from Helen Shikanda from the Nation Media Group in Kenya. And she says the budget for the summit is about 26 million, but we have managed to mobilize about half of that amount. How do we plan to fill the gap before the summit starts? Um, let me say again that uh, we have received overwhelming support from different fronts, from uh, uh, states uh, both within Africa and beyond, um, development partners uh, varied uh, in, in scope in terms of the support we have received. And yes, uh, the summit budget is, has, as, as has been stated, 26 million. And uh, we are uh, in a good space, I must say. Um, the, the deficit that uh, we have currently is uh, in a good space because we are still engaging with partners who have made commitments, may not have been farmed up, but uh, we, we are okay. We are doing okay with the budget and uh, uh, High Excellency can confirm that. And this is a demonstration of how timely this discussion is, as, as has been demonstrated by the varied and very intentional support we have received. And uh, like I said, of the 13,000 uh, registered delegates, they, they cover 130 uh, countries. And that is encouraging for us that indeed it, it validates the fact that this is timely and uh, of interest to everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will come to Minister King, and there are three questions here regarding uh, young people. And this, uh, these questions are coming from Kwabe Victor, who is a journalist of uh, Climate Lens News. So the first one, uh, Victor says, what is the role of the youth in forging a path forward in green jobs and a green economy? The second one, you have already responded to, I think, in your first uh, comments, where he's talking about engaging the youth and uh, building their capacity. So I think that one has been, um, has been uh, responded to already. So then the second question, effectively, would be, is the inclusion of the young people in addressing the diversity of climate change space uh, green jobs encompassing are the green jobs encompassing both youths from marginalized and urban areas those two questions for you minister okay thank you very much um, when we talk about um, the role of the youth um, in forging green economy it should be noted that in Africa currently um, the need the rationale 
for engaging the youth. Not only in forging green economy is paramount. Because um, we have the problem of the youth bulge. We're in, um, we have this mass, thousands of unemployed youths who do not have any faith, do not have any confidence in Africa, who think that the only way they're going to make it in this world is to go to Europe and thus willing to take the risk of going through the dangerous Mediterranean Sea to um, find themselves in any European country. So um, it is important that we engage the youth, that we care for them, that we provide for them. Otherwise, they are going to be a tool in the hands of bad politicians for fomenting chaos in Africa. Thus, we should look at um, providing incentives for them. In the rural areas, for example, certain um, NGOs I know in some parts of um, Sierra Leone and around the Gola Forest, they provide um, financial support to the youths so that instead of engaging in maybe logging of trees, you subsidize that revenue. Somebody mentioned, you know, how serious are we in terms of um you know um pursuit of green energy solutions when we are still dependent on fossil fuels that is oil coal and gas so we need to see how we engage the youths how we provide incentive for them innovation again training the need for you know to support their innovation their innovative abilities and tendencies and um, in that way we will be able to bring them fully on board to support government um, development aspirations not only with regards green energy but with regards the general socio-economic um, situation in Africa thank you um, just the last part of that question, Minister, was um, what you are talking about. Does it include both um, youths from urban and from marginalized areas? Definitely, it includes both from youth from both urban and marginalized areas. Because as it is now, it is even very difficult to draw a distinction because of what you refer to as um, the rural urban migration because of underdevelopment you know most of the youths you, whom you expect to find in the rural areas are now in the urban area yeah so it's applicable thank you thank you very much let me just sweep through the room again for the journalists in the room do i see any more hands no all right, let me go back to our last uh, set of questions coming from our online audience. Um, and this is coming from Coach Gilbert of Radio Africa Group. And I will put these questions to the commissioner. African countries are often accused of not forging a united front during climate change talks, yet they suffer the most. Will this be addressed during the summit? That's one. The second one is when the cabinet secretary says we will be calling for a new finance architecture. Does this mean that all the loans that we have borrowed from international partners will have to be renegotiated afresh? That's two. Then lastly, during the summit, will African countries take a position on financial institutions still funding energy sources such as coal? Commissioner, those three questions for you. Thank you. United Front, that's a very good question. Are we really united in Africa? Are we really united in Africa? That's an, op an open question to back to you. We were supposed to host the climate, the Amsen here. Our ministers are in the town, but they are not in the same. They are not in the same journey with us. Are we united? So if we don't change that mindset, if we don't respect our institution, if we don't respect our culture, we will not attend the objective. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but we will not attend the objective. 
we need to be united to, in order to go to this front. We, are, we, are, we have a CADEP. We are, going, we are pushing the CADEP. The CADEP is not functioning because of lack of unity, lack of implementation. So we hope that this, uh, this uh, uh, declaration that is coming should be really a reality. Because we are the one exposing ourselves by our behavior. I think Africa, let us stand and, st and, and look at uh, this continent. We have a lot to give to the future generation. The second one, the new financing ar ar architecture, I think it's time for us to change uh, this architecture and for us to force to change this architecture, the international financial architecture. Because even when we look at the uh, climate agenda, we are really, uh, we, we as uh, uh, African countries, we don't get much support from those, all these, uh, the green fund. We, so we need to change. We need to change, we need to change the overall for the development. Because when you look, we look at uh, uh, the, the interest rate rates that we get from the Bretton Woods uh, 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 institutions, it's about 7% for Africa. Uh, what is the, 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 the gross rate, I mean, the, the gross rate of each country? A country, you have a gross rate of 2%. Will you go and get, get a loan of 7%? When are you going to pay? That's why we are saying we want you know, this international institute, financial ar architecture should be changed and should benefit us also as well. You see, first if they did it against us, 7% is too much. So after we enter in this uh, third question, you're saying of a uh, debt release or uh, whatever, I, I want to really congratulate, I think it's, a, it's a one country that was able to manage it in this uh, G G20 that uh, just, eh? Zambia. Zambia. I, I really, I really commend Zambia for negotiating, and I think it should be done for many countries. I think uh, Ghana is trying to also work on that, and many other countries to to have the debt relief. Mostly after these two big shocks that we went through, our economy, whatever we gain as a progress, dropped down because of COVID-19 pandemic. Now the war of uh, Russia and uh, and Ukraine. So I think it's a moment for us to really come on the table and come, and I know that uh, President uh, Ruto is really championing it very well, this architecture, and all his, his, uh, his peers are trying to join him on the same key message. But we have to have key message. Your first question is united front. United front of what is happening in this capital of, uh, of uh, Addis Abeba, with the headquarters here, with all the privilege. We don't have a, 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 a united front. We are not going to go anywhere. Um, allow me to just support uh, the point on the new financial architecture. Um, as I had said earlier, we are talking about the need for fairness. We are talking about the need for equity. Um, we are talking about uh, accessibility and fairness in the risk parameters applied in the, in the dispatch of uh, uh, the funding that goes towards uh, development, um, as well as uh, climate action. And uh, again, the, the proposals on the table in, in terms of the fairness and the equity we want to see is, is where we have um, a mechanism which is global in nature, contributed to by every other actor in the globe towards the decarbonization agenda which will take it out of uh, you know, the nat national interest capture um, and one where the, the main uh, parameter for dispatch or allocation will be based on the decarbonization need. And that then speaks to the question that somebody asked on how do we onboard countries that are fossil fuel reliant when we have um, a mechanism really targeted at decarbonization and uh, distributed according to the decarbonization needs uh, as we all come together to say this is a global uh, problem that we must deal with globally and everybody is uh, an equal player um, or an equitable uh, uh, mechanism through which everybody has a, a stake and whose goal is really uh, that just transition. So. Again, um, in the discussions that are ongoing,
this is one of the solid outcomes with specific um, uh, proposals that is going to come of the Nairobi Declaration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll just take the final comment, uh, which is coming from one of my own constituents, <laughs> constituents. and this one is uh, Abdul Karim Mojid from Nigeria, who is with the Premium Times in Abuja. He says, I've observed that uh, traveling across African countries is quite expensive and this could be a major challenge for journalists who intend to attend the, and report on this significant summit. Are there funding opportunities for genuine journalists in this regard? I feel it is important to prioritize journalists' participation at summits like this to amplify the African climate stories. And also, I have applied for accreditation to cover the summit, but I've not gotten any response yet. I feel that it is important to know the status of this application in order to plan accordingly, as most hotel accommodations in Nairobi are getting fully booked already while prices of flight tickets are skyrocketing significantly. So very briefly, in response to um, our brother Abdul Karim in Abuja, um, there aren't any funding opportunities that I'm aware of, unless uh, perhaps uh, some of our panelists might be able to shed more light on that. I'm not aware of any funding opportunities for journalists uh, to attend this, um, this, this summit. And then uh, to the issue where you say it is important to prioritize journalists, uh, yes, definitely. And if you want to have more information on this summit, you can go to the African Union website, which is www.au.int. There is a landing page that is speaking specifically to this uh, summit. And there is information on how journalists can get to accredit so that they can attend and i believe there is also another website uh, which is um, africa climate summit if you look it up online you'll be able to find it and both those sites are providing ample guidance for journalists to be able to participate then as to your last question of i've applied for accreditation to cover the summit but you've not gotten a response as yet I do encourage you to go to that African Union website because there are contact details and the key focal person on this summit is called Molalet. So if you go to that website and you see the address of Molalet, then you can write uh, to Mola and he will be able to attend to any um, inquiries you might have in terms of getting a response or not getting a response. And then finally, I just want to encourage um, all the journalists to accredit through this uh, website, uh, www.au.int, and also to inform you that um, the accreditation ends on the 28th of August. So we still have a, a few days uh, before that website um, is, is then closed. So please go ahead and do your accreditation. All right, now um, I've seen some hands going up from our partners and um, other attendees to this briefing. I have a note here that says that there is another briefing session um, coming up after this. So I think perhaps we should uh, take advantage of that um, to answer any questions that might be coming uh, from the non-journalist uh, participants. Commissioner? Hmm? Oh, I thought you were saying something. No, I was asking, there's another one after this? On um, this is the note that I have here. Is it still on the same uh, topic, the mm. climate, African climate? Yeah, it says there is another briefing session for, the, or mm. would you prefer to, to hear the views very quickly? Mm -hmm. Because I'm, I will soon be traveling. Okay, yeah. all right. So very quickly, I saw a few hands going up. Um, okay, the first one was the gentleman here. Please be very brief because we've overrun our time and then we'll come to you. Thank you. No journalist uh, from the Netherlands Embassy. Uh, just some practical uh, questions. Maybe first to Minister Tuya. This can be huge, right? More than 30,000 uh, targets and so on. Can you say a little bit in terms of conference center, hotels, um, practical uh, things? And, and then maybe also uh, for Commissioner Sacco, 
to get from that huge thing to a declaration, that's a long way. And it's a complicated discussion in many topics. Um, is there already some kind of structure how you want to have the sessions? Is there a draft program already that you can look at? Thank you. Thank you. Let me just combine the questions. Please go much. ahead. Um, thank you, Ambassador. So, Commissioner, maybe you could respond to the two questions uh, posed by... No, the, f the first one, I think, is the Minister. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of the, the, the practical uh, logistics, uh, so the summit will be held at the uh, KICC, the Kenyatta International uh, Conference Center. And uh, we are, uh, we have um, a multi-sectoral -sec team, really, that is looking into the security, the transportation, um, the, you know, the accommodations, and a lot of that information is uh, getting updated on the summit website. Um, we have had uh, very robust engagements with the uh, diplomats in Nairobi uh, from across the globe as, as uh, late as, as recently as yesterday morning. Um, and therefore that information is out there. Um, and uh, I'm not quite sure what specifically you're looking for, but uh, the information is out there, we are set and um, all the, the concerns have been taken care of. We are offering um, um, visas on arrival for, for our delegates. Uh, that information is also out there to make sure that uh, we have no bottlenecks. And, and, and we, we have gauged the capacity of the conferencing facilities at uh, KICC. We have uh, gauged the capacity of our hotels uh, against the numbers that are coming through and uh, all is uh, taken care of. That's all I can say. And of course, to the uh, Danish government, we are extremely, um, uh, you know, uh, acknowledge and value the support that has come through. Indeed, the secretariat offices that we are sitting on in Nairobi are fully supported by the Danish uh, government. And we are happy to hear that uh, even with this solid proposal for a new uh, financial architecture, for uh, climate action that uh, you, you already have uh, the desire to support and, and that is encouraging to, to show that uh, really what we are discussing is uh, uh, timely and resonating with our partners globally. Yeah. Thank you, Minister. Um, the colleague from the Danish, both your questions have been answered. Okay, could you give the second one, please? Okay. Yes, uh, th thank you. Yes, we have uh, a draft program and the declaration. We are still we're, we're still working in the language of uh, the African Union. It's been done. 
We have uh, started uh, uh, sending it to our the, the missions, the diplomatic mission of our member states first, because this is our document. Let us uh, get the input from the, the capitals, and then after we will put it public, uh, because we even have a time frame, because we delayed a little bit. By 22nd of uh, August, our member states should bring their own input, and then we m maybe we compile it very well so that we can c become on a public uh, uh, this in uh, public uh, f uh, you know space. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So that brings our press briefing for today to an end. Uh, before we all stand up and disappear. <laughs> Um, let me thank um, very much our panelists who have been with us today. From the far right, uh, Honorable Soipan Tuya, Cabinet Secretary, Minister of Ministry of Environment, Climate Change and Forestry in the Republic of Kenya. Uh, Her Excellency Ambassador Josefa Sako, the Commissioner for Agriculture, Rural Development, Blue Economy and Sustainable Environment. Uh, His Excellency Ambassador soon to be Minister Adenkule King, uh, who is here representing Sierra Leone and is the chairperson of the PRC Subcommittee on Environmental Issues. Let me thank very much all the colleagues uh, from the media and communication sector and others who have come to support this uh, press briefing. Um, and also thank you very much to those who have joined us online and of course the technical team that has made it possible for us to communicate and to have such a successful briefing. So thank you very much everybody, good night.